J.D. Vance looks a lot like Barack Obama, except he came from a different slice of America and he has a different ideological orientation. Think of what it would have meant to call Obama a DEI candidate. There's real DEI fraud going on, which mostly involves people of color getting appointed to jobs for which they are not qualified, like the president of Harvard University. There's real DEI. And then there's this smear, you're not really qualified in the face of somebody who's actually done something. Okay, this is from Michael. What do you make of the GOP's identitarian attacks against Kamala Harris since she became the presumptive Democratic nominee. Harris, by the way, has 20 years of service in various elected offices, DA, state attorney general, senator, vice president, none of which had or has a reputation of being easy for Black people to attain. When Biden chose Harris as his running mate, She was far more qualified for the position than J.D. Vance was when Trump chose him. And Vance was indeed chosen in part because of who he was and where he came from. Well, I mean, that's certainly a good point. Um, To be honest, I mean, yes, as has been said by a few editorialists, J.D. Vance is a DEI pick himself. Um, <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> in in that, yeah. But well, then every then everybody's a DEI pick because everybody has an identity. I'm I'm not sure I I follow what you're saying. In that he was chosen partly because well, no, 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 no. Let me let me let me take that back. Of course, when you have VIP candidates, there are various reasons that you choose them. But I was particularly moved by Lydia Polgreen's editorial in the Times the other day, where she was just saying that, you know, Vance would have been a, a, an affirmative action pick at Yale because of his background. He wasn't chosen just because he was J.D. Vance. It was because of what he represented. And yet we don't think of him as DEI in the same way as we would think of Kamala Harris. But, you know, he, he, he got a leg up based on his background, and he's, you know, talked an awful lot about that background. That's why we know who he is. So, you know. Can I I comment on that? Because I find that to be very interesting. Uh, A weaponization, it's a bank shot. It's a kind of reverse English on the DEI tip. Uh, And uh, it's really about qualification. How smart is J.D. Vance and how smart is Kamala Harris? Those are the the real questions. Mm -hmm. Okay. So J.D. Vance wrote a best-selling book called Hillbilly Elegy. That's not too bad. He got through Yale Law School, and I assume he didn't do that badly there. That's not too shabby. I don't know a lot about his career, but I gather that he made a name for himself working under Peter Thiel and some kind of venture capital stuff with the smart finance guys. I assume that's, you know, he decides before he's 40 years old to get himself elected to the Senate from a big state in the United States, Ohio, and serve there more or less ably. He looks a lot like Barack Obama to me. J.D. Vance looks a lot like Barack Obama, except he came from a different slice of America and he has a different ideological orientation. Think of what it would have meant to call Obama a DEI candidate. You know, so so there's real fraud. There's real DEI fraud going on, which mostly involves people of color getting appointed to jobs for which they are not qualified, like the president of Harvard University. There's real DEI. And and then there's this uh, smear uh, kind of, you're not really qualified in the face of somebody who's actually done something. That Mm -hmm. is J.D. Vance. J.D. Vance is actually done. I'm not comparing him to Kamala Harris. She can speak for herself. I'm just saying, you know, not too shabby. J.D. Vance, J.D. Vance, not too shabby a resume for somebody who's not 40 years old. I mean, come on. He's not qualified. He's a DEI. Come on, that's bullshit, John. In my humble opinion. <laughs> I didn't say that he wasn't qualified. It's just that you could say that he was chosen for reasons other than how good he is for, for example, being at Yale. I'm not saying that was a bad thing. You know, I'm not against that kind of preference in itself. The issue is just whether or not he was as good as everyone else. I genuinely don't know. I don't know what his essay Okay, I, I guess I can't speak to that either. And uh, I, I'm, my argument is the presumption should be that he was, but uh, I don't know. But with, anyway, um, with yeah, Harris... With Kamala Harris and... Yeah. What bothers me is a kind of a bait and switch that's being pulled, which is that Biden openly said, I'm going to pick a black woman. So that leaves out everybody but black women. And that means that Kamala Harris as being a black woman was quite crucial 
to her being picked. And so you can call that DEI, whether it's the good kind or the bad kind, but it's there. But then it's become unfashionable this week to say she was a DEI pick. And so it seems as if you're supposed to think that DEI is a wonderful thing, but then you're not supposed to state that anybody was chosen because of it, which is just like with affirmative action, which is essentially the same thing, where you're supposed to love affirmative action, but a black student is insulted if you say that they were admitted because of affirmative action. I find that a little hard to have a coherent discussion about. I agree with you 100% on that. It is, in my view, a reflection of the corruption of the whole thing. You want the honor attendant to meritocratic selection. You want to be able to say to the person, the Black person whom you're putting in this position, you rightfully can garner the honor and status associated with disappointment. On the other hand, uh, you you want uh, to, uh, and, and therefore, and therefore, if I call to your attention the fact that you've been benefited by affirmative action, I'm somehow undercutting the the honor. So, for example, Kamala Harris is going to be, we're going to have the first woman black pre- uh, vice president. This is Biden. We're going to have, you know, I'm going to do something for his history's sake. Then the idea that she might not be competent for that is a complete contradiction to what it is you're trying to do. On the other hand, <laughs> you wouldn't have to do the extraordinary measure uh, if, uh, if you were overrun by competent people who were doing, I mean, you know, they they would just be there. They would just be doing it. You know, they it wouldn't have to be a designated program. Behind all of that is the presumption that there's some unfairness that has pre- heretofore prevented qualified people from being able to emerge into these positions. Uh, but you're comfortable that Kamala Harris, Vice President Kamala Harris, uh, is uh, fit. Uh, to uh, represent the Democratic Party and to lead the country. I mean, it, isn't it really extraordinary, uh, uh, her, her being catapulted into that position from obscurity? Three and a half years of service under uh, President Joseph Biden, which she's been a, essentially a non-entity, uh, and, and then to be foisted on us as a uh, standard bearer for the major uh, progressive party in the United States. I, you know. Who's really in charge? I want to know. Okay, for example, will she pick her own vice president or will Nancy Pelosi and Bill Clinton and uh, Barack Obama pick her vice president? The thing about her is that, um, and we, we've talked about her a little bit before, I wish her well. Um, there's a part of me that likes the idea that the next president might be both a woman and black and South Asian. That's interesting that... You think of her it's primarily black. You don't just say that she's Tamil South Asian. You say South Asian and black. But you can say that she's just black. Notice that black is somehow defining. That's what my next New York Times piece is about. But that's all the optics ah. of that are great. But I'm not sure, and maybe I'm missing something, but in terms of her history, I'm not sure what she's shown herself to be especially good at is the thing. Now she's attained some positions. And, you know, she's won some offices, but what is it that she's good at other than actually questioning? She's good at prosecutorial questioning. She is, she's good at that. But I, there's a thinness that I sense. And, you know, maybe she'll, you know, just like people said about Trump, maybe she'll grow into the job. Some people would say that she's incompetent. I'm not quite sure I see that. But for example, what does she stand for? So George Bush, the father, you know, openly said he didn't have the vision thing. What is she about? <laughs> you know, beyond, you know, there's the biography and, you know, big surprise. She doesn't like what happened to Roe v. Wade. Fine. But I would be hard pressed to describe based on you know, her history in California, what she's done as vice president. What's she about? Now, maybe she'll tell us over the next few weeks, but. You know, she, she damn well just, better tell us she's got to sell herself to the country. I mean, she's not Trump, and she has that going for her. But um, she has to define herself for the country and has to have some coherent, you know, easily articulable uh, account about, you know, what her, her ascendancy represents. Uh, yeah. You know, 
It's going to be hopey and changey. And we are the ones we've been waiting for. And fight, fight. We fight when we fight, we win. And, you know, don't turn back the clock to the 1950s and and whatnot. Uh, I don't know. She's not great off the cuff, actually. She's good at asking questions, but when she has to answer a question, she tends to retreat the boilerplate. She says the same thing over and over again. That's fixable at her age. And I'm not knocking her because she and I are the same age, but that, it's fixable. Whereas with Biden, it's clearly a matter of decline and Trump doesn't have to try. But she needs to be better at giving real answers to questions. I, and I'd be interested to hear what those real answers are going to be. 